On the flight deck, listeners are manning up for the podcast launch. It's time for all unnecessary shows to clear the airwaves. You're listening to The Hangar Bay, a podcast dedicated to the latest military flight simulation and hardware news. From developers to the community and everything in between, The Hangar Bay will get you squared away. Welcome down to The Hangar Bay, your source for the latest news that every military flight simulation pilot can use. Today is Sunday, April 14th, 2024. I'm your host, Sumanji, and thank you for joining me for another episode of The Hangar Bay. I hope each and every one of you have had a wonderful week in the virtual skies. And if you're like me, I hope you're having wonderful weather wherever you are as well. Spring is here. Got the doors open, or I should say the windows open in the recording studio, a.k.a. uh, my living room. So hope we won't have any problems there, and I hope you are having a great weekend. That said, before we get started, just a reminder that you can always follow along with this week's show notes on thehangarbaypod.com or watch me scroll through them on the video version of this show, which is hosted on YouTube or on Spotify. I'll mention it again in the listener feedback portion, but I'm really curious to know from any of you who are listening to the show out there, which method do you actually prefer? Are you enjoying the video version or do you find yourself using the audio podcast in the show notes? I might tweak my format going forward if uh, you're favoring one version or the other, but just curious to If you have the time, let me know. I really appreciate the feedback in that regard. That said, with that out of the way, let's get things started like we do each and every week around here with the flyby. Now, the flyby is where we aim to cover the highlights from this week's news in 60 seconds or less. Kicking things off this week, we have the BMS team dropping some new, or at least to me, screenshots from 4.38, and they discuss their plans for the upcoming Update 4 for version 4.37. Eagle Dynamics released a slew of new screenshots for their World War II Pacific Theater highlighting the USS Enterprise, the F-6F Hellcat, and the World War II version of the Marianas map. DCS received two patches this week, one planned and one hot fix, uh, which brought a slew of fixes to aircraft and campaigns. Verpal tweaked its collective lineup and announced a spring sale and is featuring 10% off their full product lineup. Activity registration is now open for Flight Sim Expo 2024. As we touched on last week, remember that this is a first-come, first-serve setup, so if you're interested in applying for that, make sure you do so today. Enigma interviewed the developer of Falcon 4.0's Dynamic Campaign and had a fascinating, wide-ranging discussion on his YouTube page. And then finally, on Spudknocker's YouTube page, he released the results of the 2024 DCS Player Survey. So that knocks out the bigger stories for this week. Stick around for the full show where we'll cover these stories in more detail as well as the rest of this week's news. And I hope you do stick around because we have a huge amount of community content this week. So I think you'll really enjoy that. On that note, let's dig in and get things started with the developers. Hey everyone, Wags here. In the developer news segment, we bring you the latest happenings from game developers and related third parties. And starting things off like we always do on the older side of the house, we'll go IL-2 Great Battles. Cast your mind back to the World War II side of the military flight simulation community, and the developers from IL-2 have dev blog number 361 this week. So the update they had for us was focused on the new Great War aircraft, in other words, the aircraft for their World War I platform, which is the Flying Circus series. They are transferring over aircraft from the original Rise of Flight engine to IL-2 Great Battles. So if you're interested in that segment of... Uh, the community are interested in that product. They said they're making improvements to the model and texture, as well as improving the systems and the flight modeling of these aircraft. They had a couple of screenshots of the new aircraft in action on the developer blog, and the aircraft they specifically referenced were the Sopwith Pup, the Airco DH2, and the Albatross D3. Uh, the new aircraft pack here is scheduled to go on sale later this summer. So I haven't actually tried this portion of uh, of their flight game over there, the, uh, the Flying Circus series. I'm not really a huge, uh, I shouldn't say, I'm not really interested in the World One One setup as much, but if you are, I'd be curious to see what you think. Are you going to pick up these packs? Um, I'm always curious about how many people fly in this segment of uh, their setup over there in the IL-2 Great Battles. That said, I'm, I'm really happy it exists, and I'm happy to see they're continuing to develop it. Shifting things forward a little bit to the modern time frame, we'll talk about BMS. As I mentioned in the flyby, this was a patch, uh, a post, I should say, that actually happened a couple weeks ago. It was originally posted on March 21st, 2024, over on the official Falcon BMS forum. So you can find their website, if you didn't know, at falcon-bms.com. The developers posted this update for their update four plans. Again, this is for version 4.37. They said their plan was for the update four 
to uh, be released in quarter one, 2024. But um, as we all know, in software development, delays do happen. Their current timeline is looking for somewhere in the May timeframe for release. And they said if things go well, possibly even late April. The plan for update four, if you're not already aware or you weren't tracking this, is they'll be imp uh, integrating Link 16 implementation for the F16. They also said they're physically based rendering or PBRs in the final stages. Uh, they, had, they said they were troubleshooting some crash to decks desktop stuff and they've got that sorted out and then for the vr fans they said open xr implementation uh, they said they believe this is finished it but uh, this developer mentioned they haven't tested it thoroughly so that's still on the way for the f-15 front we've been talking about that on previous shows aviation plus has been helping us out with some great tutorials on that front but the f-15 in this new update will be getting a new 3d model and then what caught my eye at least was they will be implementing some basic f-15 air to ground so it'll be possible to release bombs and a very basic CDIP setup. They'll also have some additional multifunction display pages implemented and some basic ILS implementation. So if you're a fan of the F-15 and BMS, you'll have some new goodies coming your way. They also have a bunch of other random fixes, bug fixes, new ballistic codes, some improvements for AMD card owners. Uh, what actually stood out to me, though, was they mentioned a hidden gem uh, such as their explosion code. And talk about detail. They said this new code will take into account the fuel remaining in objects and decide how much the aircraft should burn or if it should even explode at all, which I thought was a pretty cool feature. Uh, they also said casting your eyes looking forward. They are planning some new aircraft, and they hinted at some possible Red Forces aircraft that are in development for future patches and also implementing more F-15 air-to-ground modes. And then if you do like looking ahead at what's to come in BMS, I highly encourage you to check out some of the screenshots they posted as well. They, I posted a link to the thread in the show notes that's got some screenshots from the in development 4.38 update. There's no time frame on that necessarily. At least I didn't see one listed. But man, this has the potential to completely revolutionize the game for a lot of people who maybe have been on the fence about BMS due to a data graphic engine, well, this new terrain engine, it looks it looks top notch. So uh, credit to the developers over there who continue to do amazing things for this game uh, and even more so considering they do it for, out of their love and it's absolutely free uh, for us members of the community. Okay, shifting things over to the DCS side of the house now. We've got the neat weekly newsletter from DCS that appeared on Friday. And as I mentioned in the flyby, this was focused mainly on World War II in the Pacific Theater. And speaking of good looking visuals, man, this looks really, really solid. Eagle Dynamics is putting in a lot of good work over there. Granted, I'm a huge World War II Pacific Theater buff, so I'm absolutely biased. I have no problems admitting that. But for someone like me, the screenshots, or I should say, if you are someone like me, the screenshots they have over there. Uh, look great. So you can always find these show notes on digitalcombatsimulator.com. Go to the news section in the upper left of the page, or just find them on my show notes as well. As I mentioned, the flyby, the screenshots this week are focused on the USS Enterprise, the CV-6, the aircraft carrier, the F-6F Hellcat, and the World War II version of the Marianas map. What stood out to me on the Marianas World War II version of the map uh well, one, if you didn't already know, this will be a free update for that free map. I know some people don't love it given the limited size and the performance issues. I, hey, I'll, I'll never turn my nose down at uh, free map updates. So that's something uh, to be excited about, or at least something I am excited about. Uh, what they're going to do for the Marianas World War II version, though, is a lot of historic changes. So while the actual geography of the map won't change, the buildings, the airports, ships in the harbor, all of that is going to be completely transformed to be representative of what it was like in the historical time period of World War II, so early 1940s. They also mentioned they have a an array of U.S. Navy and Imperial Japanese surface vessels and ground units that are in development, too. And on that note, while these screenshots are superb and stellar. I'd love to hear Eagle Dynamics talk more about their plans for this theater. Specifically, beyond what they've already shown, are we going to be getting other Japanese aircraft coming to the game, you know, such as AI or player flyable aircraft? And are they planning any additional U.S. aircraft beyond uh, Leathernecks in development third-party F-4U Corsair? So is there any plans for, a, you know, the Douglas SBD Dauntless Dive Bomber or the Curtis SB2 suit? SB2C Helldiver or Torpedo Bombers? Is that functionality going to be introduced to the game, like the Avenger or the Devastator? So i just really curious to see how they plan to flesh this out. You know, we've mentioned on the show previously that there's another game uh, in development currently, Combat Pilot, which you can see at this year's Flights of Expo. They're really leaning heavily into this theater, so it'd be good competition for Eagle Dynamics. It's um, 
So more competition the merrier, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. I'm sure we will as the development continues. Keeping things on the DCS front, I mentioned they had two patches this week, which brings the current version of the game up to 2.9.4.53627. So so how many numbers can we cram in a version number? Well, we're doing our best. Uh, So if you haven't already flown uh, DCS this week, you'll have some patches waiting for you. As I mentioned, there was was an an, an initial large patch, excuse me, on the 10th of April, and that was followed by a hot fix on Friday, April 12th. Uh, lots of updates focused on uh, bug fixes, aircraft fixes, campaign adjustments. So while it's been a while since our last patch, this one wasn't as meaty I should, uh, as some in the community were hoping for from, a, I guess you'd say, a content standpoint. But what they did fix seems to have made some folks happy. So if you're a VR user out there, this patch was intended to fix the crash to desktop that some were experiencing because of the Oculus or Meta uh, version 63 software. So that should have you fixed and ready to roll. There were two interesting updates that stood out to me. One was a visual change. So they, the, the notes specifically say they added overpressure shockwave influence from bombs, missiles, shells, and gunfire on terrain vegetation like trees, bushes, and grass. And they also added a G warm-up functionality to the F-16C, which sounds interesting. So by performing a series of lower G turns, a, like four to five degree, tur- uh, four to five G turns for n- more than ninety degrees, and then turning back the other di- direction as a series of warm ups, you can actually delay the in game blackout counter. So currently, if you were to pull a max G's, which is nine point three in the F sixteen, you would black out at nine point five seconds of sustained holding that G turn. Now, if you do your G warm ups before that you'll actually shift that blackout delay out to 30 seconds, so a pretty significant change. Uh, They've also improved some of the functionality associated with G blackout, like loss of color, tunnel vision. They've all been adjusted to happen over a greater period of time. I guess my question to Eagle Dynamics is, or to you, the community, do we know if this functionality is coming to any other aircraft, and do we like these changes? Are you you someone out there who thinks this is really cool because it replicates more real-world behavior? Or... Because I guess what stood out to me was, is this really something fun that you want to deal with if you're just doing an instant action dogfight mission with the AI? I haven't actually investigated to see if the minute you hop in on a hot start, if you're already set up for 30 seconds, or if this is a you're you're defaulting to the non G warm up functionality. But it could be something to keep an eye on. Uh, either way, I think it's kind of an interesting functionality to introduce into the game. A bogey dope. Shout out to him, put together a great video showing off both of these features. So if you're not exactly sure what I'm talking about, or I just did a terrible job describing it, which is possible, certainly, you can find his great video over on his YouTube page at youtube.com slash at bogeydope. That's B-O-G-E-Y-D-O-P-E. He's a great DCS content creator, and I thought his video was really well done this week. So if you want to see any more of the fixes that happened in-game, I encourage you to go over to the DCS website hit up my show notes, check out the news change log, and you'll see if there's anything that's applicable to a campaign of interest or a aircraft of interest that you might like to know about. Okay, shifting, there, the other additional piece of announcement from this week's newsletter, still in DCS, was for a new campaign that was released by Stone Sky. So if you own the MI-24 Hind, you'll be excited this week to know there's a new campaign. This is for the Syria map, and the initial sale price is $17. Um and the, the, the brief write-up here says it's focused on an immersive, or I should say this is the first of a series of campaigns he's hoping to develop focused on some of the re- real combat operations within Syria over the recent years. He said this inaugural segment or this initial campaign focuses on the MI-24, guiding participants through pivotal events in Syria's liberation from terrorist forces between 2012 and 2018 as part of the Red Coalition. So interested in some Red 4 action, there's 15 missions here, which will keep you busy flying all throughout Syria in low-level uh, battles. So uh, one sh- a shout-out to Stone Sky. If you weren't familiar already, he has developed a series of helicopter um, campaigns for DCS, uh, as well as uh, focusing on the KA-50. He's got one for the Apache. He's got a couple uh, campaigns for the MI-8 and then a couple for the KA-50 as well. He's got one for the Huey and then he even has a JF-17 campaign. So he's a well-known campaign developer. Some of the screenshots look really great. If you're interested in that content, I encourage you to check it out. And if you do, be sure to let me know. Uh, Feature your comments on the show. Always love to hear people's feedback on some of the latest additions to the game as well. 
So that wraps things up from the official developers and third parties. Let's shift it over to the hardware news. Flight controls. Flight controls. If you can move it, toggle it, push it, or rotate it, hardware news is where we're going to talk about it. And kicking things off for us on the hardware news segment, we got Verpal back yet again with another sale. So they're really rewarding customers this lately with a lot of opportunities to sale on their great series of products. Uh, I have several of them. Uh, and one of one of my favorites that I'm going to talk about is the Collective. If you were interested in picking up a Collective through Verpal, they've actually updated their Collective products and that with an announcement this week. Uh, the counterbalance kit, what we've talked about on the show before, which was is available as separately for existing collective owners at a $35, is now part of the base rotor product. So I should I phrase that poorly. I should say is now part of the standard rotor base product. So if you want on the fence of whether or not you want a collective or not, if you purchase one moving forward, the counterbalance kit will come pre-installed for you. And they've also made an upgrade to their cams to make it easier for you to swap between the various uh, limiter ranges. So you can shift between 30 degrees, 40 degrees, and 50 degrees. The new cam will set up to make that a little bit easier for you to swap between the setups. And if you're looking to make this purchase or any others, if you check out on Verpal, use code SPRING10. That will save you 10% off your order. And it looks like that sale will be running through the end of April. So always nice to have a sale if you're looking for any new hardware purchases. And Verpal has got you covered on that front this week. Okay, so that wraps up the hardware portion. Don't have a whole lot this week. Hopefully have a little bit more for you next week. In the meantime, let's transition to the portion of the show where we highlight the work of people just like you the community. Really uh, not track it, uh, what they're doing exactly. And as I mentioned after the flyby, we have a ton of community news this week, which is always great to see. It means a lot of folks are doing great things uh, in the Flight Sim community. Kicking things off this week, we've got the Flight Sim Association back with some news about Flight Sim Expo 2024. As I mentioned in the flyby, registration for activities has opened today. So if you're looking to get your hands on one of those and get signed up for this uh, the upcoming Flight Sim Expo in June. Head on over to their website. That's flightsimexpo.com. Register, and remember, it's first come, first serve, so get your name on there. And as a reminder, shout out to Flight Sim Expo. They are one of the world's largest Flight Sim conventions, and they'll be hosting the convention this year in Las Vegas in June. If you want to know more about them, I already mentioned the website, flightsimexpo.com. It's run by the Flight Sim Association. You can learn more about them at flightsimassociation.com. And I, I want to try to keep a running list of all the community members and military flight sim developers that will be there. So if you are one of those, and I have not, I will not, I'm not going to feature you on this list. Please let me know so I can get you added. As of right now, now I should say those I've confirmed to be in attendance include Stormbird's blog, Aviation Plus, D.D. Drake, D. Drake, 1989, who's from the Hotas and Discord and subreddit, Hellasimmer.com will be there along with Verpal, Winwing, Combat Pilot. SimFab and others. So it looks to be a great attendance. This has been a traditionally more of a civilian flight sim conference in the last few years, but they're expanding their military flight sim reach. And the more members we get from the side of the house, the more that'll help them propel to continue to do that moving forward. I think it looks like a great event. And remember, you can always attend virtually online if you don't attend in person. Okay. Continuing at the community front, we have Enigma who's back with really cool interview this week. He interviewed Kevin Klemek, the original developer for the Falcon 4.0 campaign. So shout out to Enigma for this really creative interview. What a fantastic guest to get. And it really led to a great series of topics uh, covered. Enigma always does such a good job with his interviews. I feel covering some really unique questions, having a broad range of topics. Um, this interview in particular included topics such as what would Kevin have done differently if he could design the campaign over starting today? Why hasn't the Falcon 4 campaign been replicated by other developers? What exactly happened with Micropros at the end there and led to their demise? Although they're back now, shout out to you, Micropros. Great to see you developing once again. Uh, and then finally, had an interesting discussion on realism versus fun in flight sims. So I really encourage you to check out that interview. Uh, and if you didn't already see the forum post for about uh, Falcon BMS 4.38 in the video for uh, Enigma here, the interview, he just rotates through those beautiful screenshots. So you'll, you'll get them here. You can find uh, Enigma over on his YouTube page linked to on the show notes here on the hangarbaypod.com. Okay. 
shifting things over a little bit. I guess I could have put this on the hardware side of the house, but since it's a community member, I kept it here. I want to talk a little bit about the Stream Deck VJoy plug. So if you own an Elgato Stream Deck, and if you don't, highly encourage you to check it out. It's probably one of the most robust button boxes that you can have for your flights and needs. Uh, a user here enabled VJoy, pl uh, created a plugin that it su and supports VJoy. So if you're not familiar with VJoy, it stands for Virtual Joystick. It's essentially a utility or piece of software that allows you to make keyboard inputs and translate them to joystick inputs. So in other words, you can create a virtual joystick when you don't actually have one. So what's the benefit of that? Well, when you go into a game like DCS or IL-2, Fracking BMS, it shows up as a virtual flight controller. So you can actually bind to it rather than having to bind your Elgato software to a specific keyboard macro. Now, why is that beneficial? Well, uh, VJoy buttons have the benefit of working in game while in the background you might be out tab doing something else. It can support uh, multiple button presses at once. You can use the buttons while entering text in game, so like chat. Uh, and it also allows uh, compatibility with things such as joystick gremlin or having duplicate bindings. Personally, as I mentioned, I think the cool feature is essentially turning your stream deck into a fully functional button box. So. This supports our VJoy support allows you to have up to 128 buttons on any one device. Uh, you can also have simple buttons. You can have toggle switches. You can use your buttons to serve as axes up and down or sliders. Probably the biggest thing for me as someone who owns one of the Stream Deck Pluses is I can now get control over axes uh, with, with my rotational dials on the front. That's been something that's been holding me back. Maybe I'm not technical enough to have figured out how to do it correctly. Either way, lots of functionality here. Yeah, so if you are an Elgato Stream Deck user, I encourage you to go check this out. It's Stream Deck VJoy Warlock with a slightly different spelling. Just find it on my show notes. It'll take you over there. It might propel your Elgato Stream Deck functionality to the next level if you're looking to do something on that front. All right. So now we got a series of DCS community updates, quite a few of them, and we'll get started with DCS Liberation, which updated to version 11 this week. The biggest takeaway if you are a DCS Liberation Flyer is that saves from version 10 are no longer compatible. So make sure you get, if and when you update, you keep that in mind. Uh, if you're new to do a DCS Liberation or have already used it before, it's essentially like a little mini a dynamic campaign for you that you can generate uh, missions to fly with yourself or with your friends. This update also makes it compatible uh, with the latest version of DCS. I got links to the latest update on the GitHub page to their Discord and to the wiki in the show notes. Some other updates which I thought stood out to me were improved tracking of parked aircraft deaths. <laughs> if you're like me, destroying parked aircraft in DCS is a very complicated process, right? So this can, uh, update uh, tends to make that a little bit easier to do by tracking those for you. So by destroying aircraft on the ground uh, makes it a little easier to actually do that. And then that will be reflected in the update for the next mission. They added mod support for the FA-18 E, F, and G Super Hornet, which I'll be honest, I don't know much about that mod, so I'll have to go check that out. Um, and so if you're a DCS Liberation Flyer, lots of goodies in for you to enjoy this week. Make sure you go check out that update. Uh, from a third-party campaign developer, so this is Ground Pounder Sims back this week with a campaign update for DCS. So he's got a video which takes a look at the first, or sorry, excuse me, the second mission of his upcoming campaign, Last Out Weasels Over Syria 2. So it's a 50-minute playthrough video over on his YouTube page, which you can find out uh, on Ground Pounder Sims. He also, in this video, introduces the new air traffic control system for RAF Akrotiri and showcases some of the ways the missions will challenge you in this campaign, depending on your performance and actions. Uh, Last Out Weasels Over Syria will also carry on the storyline of First In Weasels Over Syria, and right now he's shooting for about 12 campaign missions on that front. So if you've flown in any of his campaigns, like I have, they're always wonderful. I encourage you to check them out. And if you haven't, over on his Google Drive, which I've linked to in the show notes, you can actually check out the demo and fly the first mission from each of his campaigns. So he has campaigns for the Harrier, the A-10, the F-18, and the F-16 over there. And I've got a link in to his Discord as well where you can learn more about it and get feedback from other players or uh, talk with Ground Pounder himself on the Discord. So shout out to you, Ground Pounder. Keep up the great work with your campaigns. And if you're looking for some new content, I encourage you to go check them out, folks. 
Okay, on the DCS mod front, we have an update from the crew over at Project Lancaster who are making the Lancaster or the British Lancaster bomber from World War II. This update was from back on April 3rd. Uh, got a bunch of links here, and they talk about a lot of the work they've been working on, which is focused mainly under the hood, they said. That's been the focus of a lot of the team recently. They mentioned things such as texture and model work, debugging some of the work they've been doing to test and debug the aircraft, some developments with the flight model and the autopilot. Uh, but one of the standout features for me was force feedback implement implementation. So they said they plan to support force feedback both in the uh, the control surfaces, specifically mentioning the yoke or the joystick, as well as haptics for third-party or do-it-yourself peripherals, like a 3D printed machine gun controls. All that I thought sounded pretty cool. Cool to see a mod team uh, going to the next level and implementing some of that functionality. But overall, they said development's going great, and they're hoping to put together a new VR video of bombing procedures sometime in the near future. So if you're tracking that uh, mod, be sure to keep your eyes out. That looks like they'll have some updates for us in the near future. Continuing on with DCS, we have some contributions from the community members over on the user files page as it relates to a dynamic flight deck on the Tarawa, so the on the Amphib over there. So the user Intelligent Goat 5960 on Hoggett mentioned he created a dynamic deck template for the LHA1. So this is picking up on some of the work that Red Kite did with his supercarrier templates. So if you're someone who likes to pop into a mission and have a more active ship or flight deck going on around you to make it feel like it's a little more lively, a uh, little more activity going on, this is a user file I thought might be of interest to you. So you can actually control all of this via the F10 menu. So you can uh, enable launch operations or recovery operations with his little template here. So you can check it out. I got the link to the user file page as well as a link to his forum post where he discusses this in a little bit more detail and a link to Redkite supercarrier templates if you don't know what I'm referring to. Uh, the, the user was kind enough to also include a video on his YouTube page where you can see in a little bit more detail what exactly these dynamic deck plates look like in action. So a really cool feature. I'm someone who always kind of enjoys seeing the world around them be a little bit more lively and less empty and stale. So as you probably know, I've mentioned stuff like this on the show before, and I'll continue to do some moving forward, but I thought this was great if you're more of a ship-based flyer specifically for the Harrier. Another mod that I might thought be of interest to many of you out in the DCS community was one focused on the F-10 map, since we just talked about that. This is detailed F-10 and mission editor map symbols. So this was developed by a user Pounce Bounce on the DCS user fail files page. The objective of this mod is to uh, embed your F-10 map or mission editor with directional icons. So essentially he replaced the appropriate icons with a uh, specific fighter, bomber, tanker, helicopter icon, as I've gotten the screenshots here in the show notes. And the ground forces are standard NATO symbols. So you can also see which direction the unit's rotated now, rather than having to click on it and see what aircraft it is and what, he what the course I'm heading. Boom. You hop in the F-10 or mission editor page, you actually just see what the aircraft is from the icon alone and what direction it's heading. So he did this for the users who aren't bothered by having proper NATO symbology, of which I am one. Uh, he decided it was... Uh, an improvement over his usual F10 mission editor workflow, so he included it in uh, the user file page for all of us. He thought it makes mission editing more appealing and easier to understand, and it makes it a little simpler in multiplayer or single player missions. He said the best part is its past integrity check, and he sets it on many missions and servers and has not had any issues. So I got a great picture of it here. Uh, if this is something you might be interested in, go ahead and check it out. I downloaded it today, and I can't wait to give it a shot tonight and see it in action. All right, from a more mission standpoint in DCS, there was a member on Hoggett this week who mentioned they were looking for a mission that, that would allow them to start in flight near a few SAM sites to practice via trial and error defensive maneuvering uh, against SAM sites. And as someone who often gets shot by SAM sites, that's probably something I should practice as well. Uh, this several users in this Reddit page, uh, or excuse me, Reddit post mentioned things we talked about previously on this show, such as Squeaky's training day and the briefing room mission generator. So game respects game. What a way to. Uh, recommend those fellow users in the community. But the one that stood out to me this week was something from The Ham Falls, which is a great username, The Ham Falls. He came through with a recommendation for a mission I was not aware of on the DCS user files page called Viper Quick Practice and Proficiency Missions by 617.evil. 
So this is over on the, I guess I mentioned, DCS user file page. I got a link to this specific file and the forum post for it as well. The standout here is these are three to 10 minute missions designed to help you practice systems workflow, refine key binds and HOTAS controls, access curves, or weapons employment. So if you're like me, you hop in game, you've changed something up in your setup, you change some key bindings, I usually pick one of those free flight missions via the instant action menu. Well, there's not a whole lot going on on that front, whereas these actually have some stuff built in for you and ready to go. So he's got missions broken up into five categories. The first one is fun. There's no stress. You just fly around. There's basic, which sets you up for landing, formation flying, spotting objects on the ground. There's the weapons category, which is threat-free environments that are just set up for weapons employment. There's advanced, which is more of a scenario-based practice, so there are live threats. Uh, read the knee board for a little bit more about that. I'll leave the briefing notes. And then there's expert, which is high-level scenarios with multiple live threats. So these advanced and expert kind of check the box here that the user was looking for about practicing SAM evasion right off the start. But I thought any of these categories would be great for members of the community looking to fire things up on their end uh, when they're practicing new setup changes or just a new aircraft in general. The one note I'll say is this is designed for the F-16C but you can easily swap out this aircraft. It's just as simple as loading in the mission editor, changing the user aircraft to be whatever you want to fly them, and off you go. So shout out to uh, 617 Evil for making this great mission and for sharing it with the community. Speaking of mission editing, we've got Skyward FM, so Skyward Flight Media, put together another entry in their mission editor series, and it was very timely as their topic of conversation was making SAM sites the easy way. So they had an inter- uh, continuing, like I said, their mission editor series. This article provided alternatives to the standard practice of just deploying SAM sites in the mission editor via the default templates, you know, the drag and drop method you can normally do. They wanted to help you make a little bit more realistic, an authentic SAM setup without requiring trigger zones, switch conditions, or managing the world levels or any moderately difficult additions. This is how do you get in, do it in a nice, simple way, but without necessarily relying on the drag and drop method. So I thought this might appeal to those of you who like to play with the mission editor and tinker with it a little bit. And on that note, this is, uh, like I said, the fifth DCS mission editor article in their series. I've got a link to that as well. You can find them on their website, skywardfm.com. This includes that Syria coin mission we highlighted back in episode five of the February 17th version of the show. That's also something I highly recommend you check out. And then finally, I missed reporting this last month, but Skyward FM just celebrated their fourth birthday back on March 27th. So uh, Stormbirds had his anniversary last week. Skyward FM, I'm sorry I missed yours about two weeks ago, but congratulations on four years of fantastic content creation for the Flight Sim community. I want to give a special shout out to the founders, Aaron River Blue Mendoza, oh, sorry, Aaron Ribbon Blue Mendoza and Santiago Cuboy Cuberos. So Great job, fellas, over there on the Skyward FM website. You can also follow them on Twitter. They're at twitter.com slash Skyward FM. And you can find them on YouTube at Skyward Flight Media. All right, ending things on the DCS note for us, we have Spud Knocker. So he has been putting together the DCS player surveys. He's done these the last three years, and he's back with his survey results for 2024. So if you don't follow Spud Knocker or not aware of him, you can find him on YouTube at Spud Knocker. And this is a community-driven survey. Survey, So, you know, these aren't going to be perfect, but credit to Spud for doing his part to help us understand the people who make up the community as well as their interests. So there's there was over four, almost 4,000 responses this year, and that's double the amount he had participate in the inaugural study back in 2022. And the best part of this video is he shows the results side by side. So you can see where the community was at in 2022, then 2023, and then finally where we are today in 2024. So I started compiling some interesting takeaways, and then I realized I think I did about half the survey. So uh, if you're interested in the TLDR, I've got it for you here. It's about an hour-long video, and Spud goes through each of the questions in detail, talking about demographics, hardware setup, player interests. I'm mainly going to focus on uh, the player interests and hardware setup. But uh, let's roll through a few of these, and hopefully you'll find them as interesting as I do. The first thing was, how do you learn about DCS? I probably shouldn't have been surprised by this, considering it was a YouTube video after all. But 90% of the community, or I should say players surveyed, said they learn about DCS through YouTube. 
60% of you said you learned through community manuals, and 44% said you actually learned through the official manual. So shout out to Chuck's Guide. You are more popular than the official manual. I should caveat all of these results by saying we're probably looking at a very specific segment of the community here, right? So first of all, you have to find out about the survey through YouTube or on Reddit, like Hoggett. Then you have to go take the survey. So you're like, most likely, given the audience of Spud Knocker, you're a multiplayer fan to begin with. You're probably in a heavy online presence. So there's always that underlining point here that this is a skewed version of the community. The, either way, I don't really know how often we see responses from almost 4,000 community members. So that's always of interest to me, regardless of the underlying assumptions. So just keep that in mind as we roll through the rest of these results as well. So the next question, which is always the endless debate, right? VR versus pancake mode. So do you use VR or do you use head tracking or do you not have it at all? VR has actually been holding steady over the last three years. It's 30% of the audience. Uh, shout out to the 10% of you that use no head tracking whatsoever. That's hardcore. Uh, so that's interesting. I do not fly in VR, so I am one of the 60% of the study that just flies using some form of head tracker. Hardware setup. This is something near and dear to my heart as we talk about hardware a lot on the show. So I thought it was interesting, the high-end HOTAS market. So those of you who have spent more than $500 on your throttle and stick has grown from 30% of the community in 2022 to now 42% of those surveyed. So that really shows you the impact of Winwing, Verpal, and VKB on the market. So getting up to almost half of those surveyed uh, are really shelling out some cash for some high-end setup. So very, very interesting. Maps that you own. So these these numbers are remarkably steady uh, over the course of the last three years of the study. So 88% of players surveyed own Syria. 84% own Persian Gulf. 60% own the NTTR. 50% own Sinai. And then just 40% own Normandy 2.0 with the South Atlantic and the channel map uh, garnering just 34% of the community. The takeaway there too for me was there's been virtually no growth between uh, over the last year, year on year for South Atlantic or the channel. So just interesting uh, perspective. I'm really curious to see where Afghanistan will fall when we do this survey next year, or I should say when Spud does it next year. Okay, maps you want more content for. This was particularly interesting to me. No map gained more than 24% of the vote and five maps each had 10% more of the vote. So my takeaway there is players are pretty evenly split about where they'd like content creators to prioritize their map for the next development. So despite Syria leading the way with 88%, which man, that is an incredible number of those surveyed, users are actually pretty split on where they would like uh, campaign creators to develop their time moving forward. And I think I probably fall into that segment as well. Even though I own Syria and I feel like I fly it the most, I, I'm pretty equal about where uh, a map or campaign would develop next. So, uh, interesting. Aircraft you own. I bet some of you will not be surprised to know that the U.S.-based aircraft here dominate the market. Eighty, A whopping 84% said that they own the F-18C. 72% said they own F-16C. And then Flaming Cliffs 3 comes in next at 64%. Uh, I specifically call it out because it's my beloved Harrier, the AV-8B, rocking 39% of the community. But then some standouts for me were who didn't own what, if that makes any sense. So no Warbird, so no World War II aircraft had more than 33% ownership rate. And the highest one was the P-51. It had 33% ownership, so that was interesting. So not a lot of participation on the World War II front. The most owned Red 4 aircraft was the MiG-21 at just 30%. So I know a lot of the community has expressed interest in the upcoming MiG-29 and in Red 4 aircraft, but just based on these surveyed, and those can skew heavily, remember, not a lot of participation on the Red 4 front. In fact, the most owned non-US aircraft was the Mirage 2000C at just 33%. So less than one in three own a non- or uh, own non-U.S. aircraft, I should say. Uh, and then if you combine the numbers, a whopping 60% of the community, uh, and, a, and a, an additional question said they almost exclusively fly the F-18C or F-16C. So Spud had a question that says, do you predominantly fly a single aircraft? And yeah, when you added up the F-18 and F-16 respondents, 60% of the community is almost exclusively flying one of those two aircraft. And that probably holds true when I see folks flying, flying on you know, the Hoggett servers 
or on some of uh, the We Run Liberation missions. Um, so just interesting to take away. There are numbers to back up a little bit of what you're seeing in some of your multiplayer missions. Okay. 88% of the community said they preferred fixed wing over rotary wing, which, you know, I don't know if that has as much to say with the rotary wing aircraft as it does the state of the ground setup in DCS right now. You know, it's it's a little hard to dedicate time, uh, especially if you have limited time to flying a rotary mission. You fly out to the combat area and boom, you get whacked by a ground force that has like laser sighting on you, regardless of if they're employing uh, a machine gun or SAM site. Uh, so hopefully as we see some developments moving forward in the ground AI, we'll see more and more people get interested in that side of the house because I do think it's a rewarding element of the game to fly. Okay, so blowing through some other questions. Most anticipated map was Afghanistan, followed closely by Iraq and then COLA. You people are crazy. Okay, COLA, clear number one. Of note, uh, maps like Vietnam, Korea, something else were not limited on here. So this was only focused on asking you about confirmed maps coming up. The most anticipated aircraft was the F-4E Phantom. Uh, it's probably no surprise there, right? People are excited about what uh, is confirmed to be coming next. That's 27% of the community. But followed closely by the EF-2000, 23%. So almost 50% of people are excited about what Razbam's got coming their way. Uh, my Ra or sorry, God, Razbam, goodness gracious, I should say Heatblur, my apologies. He what Heatblur has coming their way. Although I'll say my Heatblur love is for the A6E. I was one of the 5% who said the Intruder is the aircraft they're most looking forward to. All right, favorite era of the game. You know, we talk a lot about Enigma's Cold War server on here. Uh, and rightly so, it's a fun server that gets a lot of attention, but I thought it was interesting. 57% of the community said their favorite era of the game is the, actually the modern era, 1991 and onwards. Just 24% of you said the late Cold War is your favorite, which is 1975 to 1991. Uh, probably the biggest takeaway here is how steady those numbers have actually been over the years. So people like what they like, and they're sticking to it. Okay. Circling back to what we talked about earlier with aircraft, which do you prefer flying, red four or blue four? A whopping 88% of the respondents said they prefer blue four air aircraft. Now, again, that's what direction Spud tends to skew with his content. So there's probably a little bit of bias in that sense. But that number is up seven, up uh, from 76% over the last two years. So a uh, 12% bump there. And so obviously only 12% said they prefer Red 4, and that's down from 24% the year before. So potentially the year of the Strike Eagle at play here. I'm not really sure what accounts for that bump, but interesting to note. And then the question, do you file, uh, fly single player exclusively? So 77% of you said no. So only 23% said yes. So this now these numbers are consistent with prior years. And I think this is where we can underline about being careful with the demographic being surveyed here. So we've heard from Eagle Dynamics before, and I think uh, to some extent some of the campaign creators, that a large portion of this community actually flies single player. They don't engage in online. Potentially that means they don't engage in online content like YouTube, Reddit, or shows like this. But these commun the community survey here says 77% of you do fly online. So interesting uh, note there. I'm, I'm not really sure what that discrepancy is, or I should say how close that is actually in real life. You know, is multiplayer, single player actually 50-50? Is it the opposite way? Is it 60-40? But at least for the community being surveyed here, a lot do fly online. And when they do, they prefer PvE over PvP by a whopping margin of nearly 3 to 1. So... 74% of those surveyed said they prefer PvE online or co-op content as opposed to PvP, and I'm strongly in that community. I'm almost exclusively be, uh, exclusively PvE. PvP is not really something I enjoy all that much. I'm not against it. I have flown it, but I generally prefer flying with friends in a little bit more laid-back PvE setting. Okay, then finally, we'll end with future purchases. So I kind of roped a couple questions here together, uh, which I thought were interesting topics. Uh, less than 50% of the player base owns a World War II module. So that was probably not all that surprising, but it does give some indication of how many might be interested in that content moving forward. Uh, only 25% of those surveyed actually have an interest in a training module, which I thought was interesting. I often see online groups or squadrons talk about how we really need a training aircraft so we can improve our training process. 
perhaps I'm biased having, you know, I've been through that training process in real life in the, in the Navy pilot program. Uh, I don't really need to go back to a training program. If I'm going to have some free time, I want to fly the aircraft I actually am interested in flying. Put me in the F-18, put me in the A-10. Let me practice that way. I do see the value, but I'm also one of those 75% that does not have an interest in a training module. Uh, great for those who are, but I can understand why developers might shy away from that. You're, that's a pretty specific user base. 76% uh, of you said you own the super carrier. So there's a lot of you like me hoping we see developments on that in the near future. And then what do you want most in the game? So Spud has adjusted this question a little bit over the last few years. This year's version had a few more entries. 26% of you led the way with saying dynamic campaign is your number one uh, request. Followed up by 24% of you who said you want more continued engine improvements like Vulcan API, world map, things like that. And then finally, 17% of you said you want gameplay improvements, data cartridge, air traffic control, replay system. I think this is what I checked. I mean, trust me, I want a dynamic campaign as well. But to me, I'm not as interested in the dynamic campaign until we actually improve the underlying game itself. So that said, if you add up those numbers, a whopping 66% of the community wants Eagle Dynamics to focus on the game itself which is stark uh, contrast to me to the current business model of DCS, which is reliant heavily on right introduction of new aircraft, new maps, to some degree, new campaigns. But uh, it, it really tells the story that most players just want the game itself to be improved. So I think that's something interesting. I'm sure Eagle Dynamics is aware of that. Now how they balance that against the current business model is an interesting one because only 17% of respondents said they are, they're most interested in a new fixed-wing jet and even less said a new fixed-wing helicopter. So uh, it, it's interesting. Two-thirds of the community just wants Eagle Dynamics to fix the game, which I realize doesn't work well with selling uh, future content. So either way, this was a fantastic uh, series of responses. So thank you to the community members who took the survey. Spud, thank you for putting it together and sharing those results you can find this survey results in more detail and his video and other content, again, on his YouTube page, youtube.com at spudknocker. All right, that wraps up the community section of the show. Let's shift things over to the user content of the week now. Sometimes it's a mission, sometimes it's a tutorial, and sometimes it's just an interesting topic of conversation here in the content of the week. I always like to spell out something that I think is a little uh, different than what we've covered on the show this week. And this week, it was a user post on the Hoggett subreddit. It was a user topic of conversation. And the question was asked, what DCS module was your biggest surprise or most, most unexpected disappointment? And there were several great entries on this post. If you're interested, I would encourage you to contribute over there or let me know. Let me know here on the show in Hangar Bay. Reach out on social media or email the show. Again, feedback at thehangarbaypod.com. I just thought it was a really great question. The user Hutton Orbital asked, and he, basically this way of phrasing the you know the, the typical what module should I get question, I know that gets a little boring and, it, and it's fair. I asked the same thing myself when I was a news user, but I thought this was a unique way of kind of contextualizing that conversation and uh, more importantly it actually made the responses a lot less toxic you know we weren't the traditional response of oh uh, vaporware these things never get updated it was just some real honest conversation what people enjoyed and uh, what they didn't so personally my biggest surprise would probably be the vegan you know i picked that up from heatboard a while back and honestly i don't really know what i expected i think i expected to hate the cockpit because it's in a foreign language and it would be very confusing and honestly, I found an aircraft with some awesome old school engineering. And perhaps I'm biased because my old Navy helicopter basically ran on less computer processing power than you had of like in a modern day iPhone or iPod back in the day. Oh, I just dated myself again with that reference. But, you know, and it appeals to my low love of low level strike missions. I love flying low, flying fast, getting in, bombing something, and get the hell out. So and in that sense, I probably shouldn't have been surprised I love the Vigan, but I did. It was a surprise. It's a great aircraft. Highly recommend it. Now, my biggest disappointment, it's probably cheating a little bit. I, I'm going to say Heapor's F-14. And the reason why I say that before you scream at me is I'm not disappointed in the module. I'm disappointed in myself for not having flown it more. Like, I love the F-14. I idolized that aircraft growing up. If I could have flown it uh, when in flight school, I'd have put my name in for it. But for some reason, it's come out from Heapor, and I don't know if I've been distracted by other aircraft or whatnot, or the, just the 
raw difficulty of that aircraft. There's a steep learning curve, right? But for whatever reason, I haven't, I flew it a lot. Maybe the first few hours I purchased it and I haven't been back in. So I'm disappointed in myself for not flying it. I need to get back to it. But what about you? What's your biggest surprise? What's your biggest disappointment? Let me know. I just think this is a really interesting topic of conversation. So credit to Hutton Orbital for bringing it up. I did want to give a shout out to one user post though, uh, Fobbit Outside the Wire. He said his most pleasant surprise, or I should say they said their most pleasant surprise has been the quality of the free community mods that they either use or they're aware of, specifically referencing the UH-60, so the Black Hawk helicopter, which they said they fly all the time on Gray Flag, the C-130 Hercules, or the A-4 mod. And to which I say, yeah, great, great post, uh, Fobbit. Uh, what a wonderful recommendation. I couldn't agree more. There really are some outstanding mods for DCS. And I, I know we featured the UH-60 and the A4 a little bit on this show. And we'll probably talk about talk a little bit more about the C-130 as it's shifting from a, a user mod over to a full fidelity module you can purchase in DCS. But that's a great shout. So the community member is doing great things and they always deserve the attention uh, from shows like this. So again, re reminder, if you have any feedback, I'd love to hear what you think. Uh, know more about what you value from a module standpoint in DCS. Okay, so that wraps things up for the user content of the week. Let's shift it over to the SimPit Spotlight. So in SimPit Spotlight, it is time for my favorite portion of the show where we highlight a community member's personal setup no matter how simple or complex, to celebrate the joy of flying from home. And this week, we have a post on the HOTAS subreddit from Scorpiux, S-C-O-R-P-I-U-X. He has a hybrid cockpit, uh, and it's got some great setups here with a variety of hardware from different manufacturers. And if you want buttons, I tell you what, Scorpiux has all the buttons. We have not one, we have not two, we have not three, we have four control panels from Verpal. We have the multi-purpose UFC. We have not one, but two, but three Elgato Stream Decks. I can't sit in judgment because I may or may not have the same number. And then we also have the fantastic control, or excuse me, U, uh, MFDs from Total Controls for the Apache. Uh, I have those myself. Great piece of hardware. He's also got Verpal's Collective with the... Uh, um, excuse me, with the Hawk 60 grip. He also has the Thrustmaster TPR pedals. And then finally, the VKB Ultimate grip on the Gunfighter base, topped off with Track IR. He does not use VR. He uses head tracking. Uh, Scorpiox, after my own heart here. So many similarities in our setup, but he just looks really nice and clean. A uh, shout out to you. And a shout out to building your own cockpit. So he actually built his out of uh, customized T-slot aluminum that he had custom built and shipped to him. So pretty similar in my setup as well. And then he just rolls in with a nice looking uh, gaming office chair here and looks like a nice little TV monitor setup. So really nice and clean. I got some pictures in the show notes and a link to the Reddit post over on the HOTAS subreddit. So thank you so much, uh, Scrubber UX, for sharing your setup with us. And it looks great. Hope you continue to have wonderful adventures in that setup. So if, you, if there's any news, community content, or if you want to give a shout out and help us shine the spotlight on someone's SimPit setup, be sure to get in touch with the show via email. Again, once again, that's feedback at thehangerbaypod.com or via social media at thehangerbaypod on Twitter or Instagram. It always helps me shine a light on the great things going on in the community. And that's where we get to the listener feedback portion of the show. 612, departure radio check. Just want to remind you, you can always leave voice message for the show on Spotify or post comments in the YouTube page. They're always greatly appreciated. Always nice to know what you folks like and what you don't like about the show and what you like to feature in future weeks to come. That said, this concludes another episode of The Hangar Bay. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. We'll be back next weekend, as we always do here, to get you squared away with the latest military flight simulation and hardware news. And until then, think about what you put out into the community and make it a better place. Fly safe, everyone. Right here. Let's go down low, out of deck. Unload 500 knots. Let's get out of here. The missile knows where it is at all times. Oh, I'm sorry. What I meant to say is that you can find the video show on YouTube or on Spotify at the Hangar Bay Pod. The audio show is available on all major podcast providers. You can contact the show via email, feedback at thehangarbaypod.com, or on Instagram and Twitter at The Hangar Bay Pod. Show notes and links to everything discussed on this week's show are available at thehangarbaypod.com. 
takes a lot more than just fancy flying. 